Welcome to the master class on Attribute Paint. I'm Jeff Late, and I will be going over all the nuances of this tool and hopefully going into a bit about how it works as well. That should be of interest to people that want to dive inside of it. So let's start off with Tommy here and add an Attribute Paint. I hit Shift Enter here to place the node immediately and move the display flag. It's a, kind of a faster way to get going. And uh, by default here, I can start painting on Tommy and we can see I've got this uh, infrared um, heat map looking mask being drawn on Tommy wherever I paint. But there is something on here, namely Tommy has strangely turned purple. Uh, this is because uh, this is using a visualizer. So if I go over and right click on this visualizer, we can see the mask visualizer is on right now. And this is drawn on top of Tommy's natural texture colors. So we go from the uh, normal um, Tommy and then we add the blue overtones and we get this strange purple look to it. Now there is an option here in the view display to turn off materials, which is kind of a fast way if you want to just go to straight paint mode uh, with your models without getting in the way of any materials. So that doesn't remove the materials, it just disables them from display. So I'll have that off for most of this discussion. Uh, this nice reset all changes was great for demo purposes like this because I can keep resetting to the start. So let's run through some of the different uh, brushes and features we have in Attribute Paint. The first set is to look at um, our default brush here. This is a volume brush, and I can use Shift and drag to resize it easily. The mouse wheel also, of course, adjusts the size, it's similar to the old paint. Um, when I paint over here, currently you see everything within that uh, volume gets painted, which can be good for a lot of things, but sometimes you need more nuance. So there's some options up here to control what gets chosen. I can, for example, choose to paint only on connected components. This is nice because then I don't, uh, I can paint both sides of this uh, t-shirt without going through and uh, painting underneath Tommy. I can also pick front-faced. Um, front-faced is useful uh, when I don't want to grab the back half of the thumb, for example. Um, in this case, we'll see the back of the thumb, thumb is still blue because the polygons there are facing the wrong direction. So that's a very fast, normal test. Uh, a slower test that can be done, uh, but can be more general, is uh, visibility. And so here it will basically check for every single point that it wants to paint to, um, whether or not it's visible from the camera. And if it isn't, we end up with a uh, unpainted area. So this helps you ensure things stay in shadow where you want them in shadow. Um, these options can all be combined together, providing quite a few different choices of controlling what you paint. In addition to uh, that, there's different ways of actually selecting what uh, points get selected depending on where I click on the screen. So this was the volume brush, and so this, as it suggests, has this big sphere, and all points within the sphere will be, will be affected by the operation. Um, if I right mouse button, I can see my different brush shapes here. The brush shapes are also listed here in the parameter pane, and uh, I can switch between the different brush shapes uh, by selecting them here or by using the um, number hotkeys, which I tend to like because often I want to switch what type of brush I'm using depending on what sort of operation I'm performing. So the first one to look at is the surface brush. The surface brush uh, is close to uh, what the old paint swap did. Um, well, what it does is it uh, does a um, uh, only paints on connected components of where you um, draw by default because what it's doing is actually a surface distance computation for how far to draw. So this is particularly interesting when you come to painting fingertips. Um, so if I go down here to these fingers and I want to paint just this finger, um, I don't want to accidentally bleed over to the other finger. If I use a volume brush, um, it's hard to do that without picking up the other finger. But the surface brush picks distances along the surface, as it suggests, and so will only um, paint what I, what I want in this case. In addition to the surface brush, there is the screen brush. And the screen brush um, works to, instead of working with a volume in 3D space, this works with a circle in 2D space. In this case, the space of the screen that I'm looking at. So if I can increase this, everything underneath there will be painted. And um, because I don't have front face and visibility on, it'll paint right through the object. Uh, the screen brush is really useful for painting stuff that might not, not have geometry. And we're really just thinking about painting where it is in 2D and don't want to worry about the 3D nature of it. So for example, point clouds are something which you uh, can really only paint in 2D because they don't have any connectivity to click to if you try and use a volume brush. After the screen brush is the fill brush. The fill brush, as the name suggests, will just fill the entire um, object with whatever you paint. And so that's pretty uh, boring uh, with the um, default settings, but you might want to use this for something like a global smooth, for example. You can, uh, if I do smoothing on this, I'll just apply a smooth everywhere. So to show that, I'll just quickly 
draw something here and switch to the fill brush. And then I will do the control left click to smooth. And we can see I can just sort of smooth out my object globally. Um, but it's also useful in the paint mode with connectivity. This is kind of a neat way to, just to paint entire pieces of an object without having to um, worry about careful selections. Um, I haven't really found a use for front face of visibility with it, but I'm sure you will find some interesting uses of this. The next one's a kind of an interesting brush. This is the nearest point brush. And um, unlike the others, which are always trying to work with a region of space, this will only ever paint a single point. What it does is find the closest point to the cursor and paint that. And the big advantage here is this is really good for cleanup, where after you've done some of the other painting, you're like, ah, there's these four points I want to change. If you try and do this with a volume brush and make it small, you have to make sure you exactly get the center of the brush on that point, or else it just doesn't have the influence level you want. While it's the uh, nearest point, will just directly apply to the closest point. It can give you these really fast corrective edits where you just need to clean something up easily. That's what the attribute paint's often used for after all. In addition to what points get selected, there's a question of how to um, paint through to those points. So if I switch back to a large volume brush and do a single click on the torso, we can see the sort of shape of the, uh, the paint that we have here. And it starts off with the full opacity in the center and drops off um, smoothly to the edge. Um, the opacity to draw in the center is controlled um, by the opacity setting. So if I reduce the opacity setting, um, then we will see uh, we just paint a little bit. I need to use multiple dabs in order to uh, fill that in and get to the closer to the final result. The other choice is the soft edge setting. And the soft edge controls um, the fall off curve. And so currently the soft edge is one, which means it starts falling off towards zero right from the very center of the brush stroke. And if I make the soft edge zero, it's going to go uh, solid one all the way to the boundary and then fall immediately to zero. And if I make the soft edge instead of something like 0.5, it's going to go solid core of half the radius of the brush and then fall off from there to zero. The other control is the foreground and background colors. So in this case, there isn't a color. This is painting on a mask attribute, and so it's using a float. And the default values are 1 and 0 for the foreground and background. The left mouse will uh, use the foreground color, and the middle mouse will use the background color and overwrite them. And so, of course, I can change these values, and then my background color will do a medium, and my foreground color will erase. In addition to background color, there's the paint mode. Um, the paint mode controls how we layer on additional paint or mask in this question onto the existing painted um, surface. So the choices here are the um, whether or not to do uh, over, add, maximum, or minimum. Over is traditional paint operations. So if I draw with one, it's going to replace with one. And if I draw with zero, it's going to replace with zero. But I can do something like add, in which case, as I add more and more, I'm going to get values much greater than one in the center here. I can't see them because my visualization here is capped to one. But if I go to my visualization settings, I can change the range here to say three or five or six. And now we can see that we have to build ourselves up to that. In this case, the middle mouse button does nothing because adding zero does nothing. I can make the background uh, minus one. And now I can subtract, basically, rather than add, and then do uh, addition and subtraction, which are sort of unbounded in this case. If you want to do bounded edits, that's where the maximum can work. So a maximum value here will clamp between 1 and the value there. So the values there well outside will get clamped back down to, to 1 or expanded up to 1 if they're below it and uh, or kept above. So a minimum will, of course, uh, then clamp down. So make this, uh, sorry, 6 again. And we can see where I do minimum. It'll just clamp it out, but it won't affect areas that are, that are 0. So that puts a sort of ceiling on what the values could be. and restore this to the original um, drawing capability. There we go, and reset our, all of our changes. The, another important point here, though, is when we say add and uh, maximum, etc., cetera, um, that is affected by what the incoming mask color is. But due to the nature of attribute paint, what it's storing in the end is sort of an application layer that it'll be reapplied to whatever the incoming model is, because the incoming model may change. After all, this is a procedural package. This is not a static result. So if I first uh, draw a little stroke on Tommy like this, and then I erase a stroke like this, um, it looks like the center area is returned to its original values. 
but it's kind of uh, subtle that it actually hasn't returned original values. It instead says paint over with zero there and paint over with one here, and the rest of it says keep the original value. Um, we can see this in action if we do a attribute expression and we make a mask attribute ahead of time. And so I'll plug this in, uh, change it to custom mask and to a constant value of float. And now I can change the incoming value. And if I display the attribute paint and go here to parameters, bring up a parameter pane for this one, and now I can change that incoming value. And we can see that um, if I make the incoming value one, painting over with one, of course, doesn't make a difference. Um, but we can see that that blue area at the bottom is actually painted in blue. So it's going, in this case, mix 50% into the blue and 50% into the, uh, the red to get the result. And this also affects the um, paint mode. So if I did add paint mode here, um, this does not add to 0.5. So if I have whatever my result is and change that constant value, it's not going to actually change what the resulting um, value is. It's not a result of re-adding every time. It's always going to be an over-operation for the application to stencil. So let's reset that back to the default values. We're going to start off by drawing a hard mask across uh, Tommy to make a more clear example. So turn to over and to set my soft edge to zero and put a very hard edge so we can see some effects here. Now, when we do our paint mode, uh, currently we're in paint mode for all of our brushes. So I can uh, right mouse button and you can see what the default behavior of the left and middle mouse button operations are. Uh, paint means to paint with the foreground color if it's left and paint with the background color if it's middle. And uh, then we have smooth, erase, and eyedrop options. Now, um, as it happens, the, with the old paint stop, you'd have to switch between them here all the time. Um, but in this case, we also have control and control shift modifiers. So you can actually set up this whole menu of possibilities here in the parameter pane. And uh, our default actually expose all the possibilities. So I don't really need to use our right mouse button menu to get to them if I'm willing to use control and shift. So left, as we've shown earlier, does a paint operation. And um, control then does, if it's left mouse button, does a smooth. And so I can just repeatedly smooth in different areas and blend out the results. It's probably one of the most um, common operations one does to clean up what one has uh, drawn. The other one is control middle mouse button. This does erase. And this is uh, relevant because, as we said before, if I draw zero here, it's different than not having drawn it at all. So if there is an area, if you do have an animated incoming mask uh, value and you're trying to layer some operation on top of it, um, you might want to remove the layering of that operation. And control actually removes it, allowing that incoming area to animate again. Um, the next one's control shift. And so control shift left mouse button will update the foreground float color. And then control shift middle mouse button will update the background color. And so we're able to thus um, just read off what the actual values are on the geometry rather than trying to guess them or set them by eye. The next option in here is, as we go through this tab, we've pretty much covered the options on the brush tab now. Um, most of these exist in the parameter pane area um, in the toolbar or in the right mouse button menu or are available as hotkeys. So this is probably actually less used in this directly interface here. Um, the one missing in my explanations, opacity pressure and radius pressure, these are involved if you have a, a tablet. Um, in that case, we can read the pressure sensitivity of your tablet and vary the size of the brush and vary the opacity of the brush depending on how hard you push. So a value of one means it will actually vary fully from um, zero opacity to 100% opacity depending on zero weight and 100% weight. A value of zero will cause it not to be changed by opacity. So you'll always draw with full weight. Um, so if you want your brush strokes to always have full weight and just vary size, you set this to zero. If you want them to vary um, their weight but not their size, you set radius pressure to zero. And if you are using a mouse, then it really doesn't matter what you set these to. So next tab we'd like to go to is we're going to skip the attribute tab for later and instead go to symmetry. And there is one type of symmetry currently supported, which is mirroring. Um, the default mirroring um, does the radius and uh, sorry, mirror in the x direction, which for Tommy actually works out nicely. So we can see we've got a nice mirrored uh, drawing here. It's important to note this is um, mirrored by drawing the strokes twice. So this is subtly different than mirroring by taking what I draw and flipping it over and reapplying to points on the other side. So if you actually have a non-symmetrical model, um, it will resend the rays on the other half of the model and might catch a surprisingly different location or might catch something a surprisingly good location, depending on 
how your model is non-symmetric. We can also um, uh, change our mirror direction. In this case, I'll change it to uh, in Z direction, which isn't a very good mirror direction for Tommy here. Um, but uh, some locations, we should be able to get uh, some mirroring uh, occurring. Yeah, there we got some on the, the leg there. Um, but uh, it's kind of the important point to notice here is that changing the mirroring did not change my previous mirroring. Um, these these values that we use are baked into each stroke we send into the uh, stroke history, and so changing them now will not change the previous stroke. So if you do a whole setup and then you realize, oh, I wanted to have mirrored that, um, you can't just turn on mirroring and have all your strokes become mirrored. Uh, you know, instead you probably need to use a mirror swap or something like that to explicitly mirror it after the fact. So let's. Uh, Reset the changes again. Let's look at the top of this interface. There is a group field. And um, this group field is a bit different than most group fields in Houdini, so bears some discussion. So let's just paint in a bit of his arm. And let's say I go to the reselection method for the group and select his head. Um, we note that I've got a group that refers only to the head here. I can turn on display group, and it will actually show me what things are in the group. Um, but I continue to paint on the uh, parts that were grouped out. That's because this group field's only used as a sort of stencil for the current act of painting. So when I paint now, I won't be able to paint outside that group. So I've been able to isolate part of the model to make sure my painting doesn't uh, accidentally contaminate stuff that I've already decided are good. But uh, this group is not, it's just like the mirror operations is baked into each of the strokes. So if I reselect my group again and grab his arm here, now my previous painting of the face stays intact and I'm not able to paint up there anymore until I um, reset my group to a different area. I could blank and now I can paint everywhere. Maybe do some um, blending in here. The next part to talk about is probably to go back into this purple uh, Tommy um, issue again. So we're, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're using an attribute visualization to, to see this because we're not actually drawing to color. If I middle click here, um, and bring up the information, actually bring it up so we can see it in the screen capture, um, the, you notice there's no CD attribute. There's no color being put out. The old paint shop, when it wanted to, when you paint it to something like mask and you wanted to see the color, would actually have to output a CD attribute that then would try and remove after the fact um, to avoid contaminating downstream nodes. But uh, in this case, there is no CD attribute. We're just using a visualizer for this purpose. And the visualizer, as I mentioned, is available in this menu here as uh, the mask visualizer. But there's a few other places where it shows up where you can get to to control it. In particular, um, we have where the attribute is chosen here in the attribute paint swap interface. There's this little visualizer button, and we can click on that to um, turn on and off the visualizer. So it tries to turn it on automatically every time you enter the state, because usually you want it on if you're painting, and turns it off when you leave the state. But if you're looking at other things downstream and you want to see what that mask is, you can just turn it on in general and have it uh, stuck on. Um, the other place it shows up is the toolbar, of course, has the attribute selector. So again, you can click there to turn on and off. Another neat thing in Houdini 18 is these visualizers have the ability to control click them. So if I control click this visualizer, it'll send me straight to the visualizer editor. So it's a little bit faster than jumping through the um, edit button over here uh, to control that particular visualizer. So one thing of note is there is this attribute uh, menu, and this attribute menu has a single entry, which is a really boring entry, mask. You know, you're like, am I able to paint anything other than masks? And the answer is yes, and in particular, you're able to paint more than one attribute in the same SOP. Um, we sort of supported this in the old paint SOP, but it got very confusing because it was never really explicitly listed. And so people would change which attribute they're painting on, and the internal cache would not necessarily apply all of them or forget one of the attributes, and very confusing stuff kept happening to people. So with this version, we decided to make which set of attributes you paint on an explicit list. So when you set one up, you decide what things you want to paint on, and from that, you can then um, select from that uh, menu while you're painting. One advantage of this is if you are writing a shelf tool that creates an attribute paint, you can populate this with the things you know artists will need to paint on, and then they can just use the pre-filled in forms that are available to them and not have to worry about exactly how to spell fuel properly. So let's pretend we do want to um, paint on something else. So let's add a new attribute here and uh, call it fuel. And now I can go back into the, uh, the paint state, 
And currently I'm painting the mask and we can say we have this particular set of interest in paint choices done. And I can switch which thing I paint on to fuel. And now I've got a blank zero um, attribute and I can paint uh, fuel, F for fuel. If I switch back to mask, we can see the mask. Switch to fuel, we see the fuel. So here again, we are seeing um, both attributes are being painted on. And if I middle mouse button, we can see we have both fuel and mask on the output. Now let's try something more interesting. That's another float attribute, but I can put in something like CD and make this a color attribute. And this is a much more traditional attribute to paint on. And so if I go to color, I can uh, middle click to paint black, uh, change my foreground color to something more interesting and give uh, Tommy a nice green face here. There we go, looks good. And uh, so now we are painting on um, color. And again, we can switch. We note that actually, sorry, we note that the foreground color and background color are now colors rather than values. Um, so we can look at the mask, the fuel, and the color attribute. And again, these are all being output from the um, setup. In addition to float and color, there's another one we can do, which is kind of interesting, and that's uh, integer. So we're able to actually paint on an integer attribute. The advantage of integer attributes is that they don't blend. So if you have four and six, halfway between them is not five, it's either going to be four or six. And so this is useful when you have something like maybe entity, where you're trying to um, record uh, which type something is, uh, and you want a universal value for it. So if I go to the entity visualizer here, um, this will just use the random color visualizer on the integer number. And in this case, it's kind of fun to go to um, the add mode, do plus one and minus one as my two additions. And now I can either increase or decrease um, different areas. Uh, but it's also cool to use the fill brush here with connectivity. Um, actually, let me just set over to set this to one value. And now what I can do is um, just change the, uh, the number to identify each model section with by clicking a few times. So uh, put that as a value of two. Um, the eyes I'll make into a three. So one, two, three, and one, two, three. And there's a mouth bag hiding in here. I can grab that one, two, three, four. So now I've sort of identified different parts of the Tommy model as uh, different integers and um, done so rather quickly and efficiently. And so now I've got a unique integer for each of those um, pieces. Now we're going to move from Tommy at this point, um, mostly because uh, Tommy reuses textures, so some of these techniques don't work very well. And we'll instead move over to the squab. So here's the default uh, squab, and I'll subdivide it so we have some um, additional uh, detail to paint in. And I'm going to just write a simple test sequence across the squab using different strokes. So attribute paint. I'll start with the volume brush here and write a nice letter T. And then switch to a surface brush, and I'll write an E. And now switch to a screen brush, and I'll write an S. And then go to fill brush isn't very interesting. We'll just make everything one color. So go to nearest point brush and write a T. So I have the word test written there on the side of the squab. We notice the screen brush obviously went straight through because uh, I didn't put visibility only or anything on it. And the uh, surface and volume brushes, um, you know, uh, did the equivalent thing. So volume would have actually uh, done both sides here, but surface would pick one side or the other and then use the local surface distance, which is why we see that uh, discontinuity there. And um, the nearest point brush, of course, does this very harsh one or zero type drawing on individual pieces. Now, having done this, let's first just see what happens if someone wants to uh, make a different T-pose for a squab. They decide squabs. This isn't the rest in geometry for squabs anymore, but unfortunately I did all my uh, painting on this supposed rest geometry and they've changed it upstream. So I've got a new shaped um, squab to deal with. So let's do a bend sop and um, put this in ahead of time. And with uh, Houdini 18, we have a much nicer bend. So actually if I look in here, I can see um, I'm in the state for the bend and there's some nice options for uh, how to change how to bend. So in particular, I'm going to turn on the capture handle with G and uh, just move this back so I can um, capture all of the squab like so. And maybe grab the higher up in the tail. He's more centered here. And now I can just bend them upwards. So you can see here, here's the rear end squab. And if I look at the resulting um, attribute paint, 
um, and, uh, and turn on its visualization of its attribute, uh, we can see that the test actually is matching it uh, rather precisely. So I'm going to actually go back to um, Bend and make sure we turn on the mask visualization. And as we bend it, we can see the test is sticking to the surface. So that's kind of cool. Like I, I don't have to repaint my stuff even though the incoming geometry changed. But this is because we're actually storing a point cache. So what we do is we strip out um, just the points of the geometry. We store all the attributes we painted to on those points. And that becomes the stashed thing that gets saved with the hip file and reloaded and reapplied. And so that makes it very fast to reapply because you know it's a simple point operation. We don't have to replay all of those uh, brushes. It also means if you have point-to-point um, -point correspondences, um, the geometry can just reapply the um, stuff quite nicely. Um, but we don't always have a point-to-point -point correspondence. So we're going to restore this to a zero bend squab. Um, but before the bend, I'm going to throw in something else that happened upstream. Uh, the modeling department decided to change the uh, mesh resolution and they shoved it through a remesh. And if I change this to a target size of, say, 0.05, we now have a much um, different looking mesh. And so if I look at attribute paint on this different looking mesh, we have complete garbage. So basically, there's no point correspondences between these two versions. So this also happened with the old paint swap because it also internally just stored point correspondences. And there's really nothing you could do with the old paint swap. You'd have to uh, redraw from scratch at this point. However, now, if we go to the recache menu, um, we can see there's actually some extra interesting choices here to, uh, to deal with that. In particular, there's a choice to bypass the point cache. So if I turn this on, it will actually just reapply the strokes um, from the stroke history and ignore the point cache. And so this actually almost works for a couple of letters. So we note that the volume brush works fine. That's because it's storing the original values of where we had drawn on the surface. And those original values are at the same location. Um, and so we just capture the new points that are in similar locations. Similarly, the screen brush was drawing that from that screen location. And so that ended up going through just fine. Um, the surface brush is, is lost. This is because it tried to store which primitive and where on the primitive it actually uh, drew, and that doesn't exist anymore, so it's not able to draw the surface uh, anymore. And likewise, the nearest point brushes obviously are the nearest point on a particular primitive, and we have no primitive correspondences anymore. Um, but what we can do is not use the original values. We can actually uh, choose some options to recache them. So one is to resend the rays. This is a bit more expensive, so in this case, um, we instead of playing back where the um, points ended up, um, we take the original screen locations of those points and play it back as if you were drawing them again from scratch. And so that will resend the rays, and now we see the surface nearest point and all these brushes worked fine. Um, I should point out, actually, while I'm talking about original values, before you think there's no particular benefit for the original values, um, one benefit is if I do an extract all points, um, on the incoming geometry, which leaves just a point cloud. Um, at this point, the this will actually work as well. We can't see it here very well, but you can see the T and the S survived. So if you want to draw on a point cloud and have like a polygon representation of it, you can draw on the polygon representation and swap it out for the point cloud afterwards and then get the, um, the thing copied over. I find that's quite useful uh, when I have like a scatter workflow and I know what I want to draw on it, and then I'm like, wait, I want to do this on scattered points. You can change the resolution of the scattered points and get that uh, copied over fine. But uh, in this case, let's focus on the solid one because uh, then resend rays will work. Resend rays will not work against a point cache um, because obviously it won't hit anything and, it, and nothing will happen. Um, so let's now change our bend values while we stare at the uh, mask results. So go down here, make sure our mask is being displayed. And on the bend, we can change our bend. One second, get rid of those handles. And as we change the bend in the squab, we see this really cool thing where the test is actually just sort of being slid along the surface. Now, that's because it's been sent as, as if this was the new geometry. And so you're not able to sort of stick it to the uh, squab's proper location. This might be what you want for some deformations. But in a case like this, if, the, if they decide they want this new pose, I want them to apply to where it is on that new pose without me having to change it all. So let's first turn off the remesh for a bit um, to show another option. So with the remesh off and uh, bend going on, let me just uh, make sure I've got the right uh, display here. Um, 
uh, we'll, we'll see we have the same result as we did with the rematch, namely it's sticking because it's resending the rays. Um, but let's go here and change it to primitive UV. And primitive UV looks very promising there. And so I'll go back to the mask view. And we'll see this actually does stick on as we sort of expect. So in this case, we're storing what the primitive and where on that primitive we hit was. And uh, so this is the barycentric UV coordinates, as we like to call them in Houdini. And so as long as your primitive count stays the same, it will be able to find the original location and uh, reproject the points. This is pretty close to the point cache, though. So usually you'd be better off just storing the point cache and rather than using this option. But it might be you don't have the point cache for some reason, you need to play it back, in which case this is probably the best choice. For example, some people don't want the point cache because they're trying to save space in their hip files, then primitive UV might be the best reconstruction option for them. Um, the trouble with primitive UV is that just like the original values um, or the point cache, it has problems where if our um, if we remesh our geometry, those primitive numbers don't make any sense, and now we're going to get very strange results. Um, but there is something we can do uh, to preserve even this case, where we have a def uh, remeshed and deformed incoming geometry, and we want to somehow get this to work properly and stick properly. And that is the texture UV. But before texture UV works, we have to fix the textures. Um, so we haven't seen this, and actually seen garbage here. But if I go back to the remesh, the reason why we're seeing garbage there uh, becomes apparent if I turn on the texture display. Uh, we can see we actually have really ugly textures all over here. Um, these seams have got completely uh, crushed by the uh, remesh process. If I switch to the texture display, um, we can see why we're not able to reproject. Um, if we start with the original um, texture map, that's all nice, good, discrete islands, um, and then go to remesh, there's no way this is going to work well. Um, fortunately, there is an option. I do a group by attribute boundary. And group by attribute boundary, I can specify defaults UV, which is rather quite, uh, useful. And so by actually just default uh, behavior, it's just grouped edges for all those seams in our texture map. And Remesh does have an option to um, provide hard seams. And so the hard edges group, I uh, can point to the group from attribute boundary. And now the Remesh, when it comes back, um, will, will, will no longer have such ugly garbage along those boundaries. I can even go here, and we can see we actually have reasonably good results. And now for the moment of truth, we go down to attribute paint. And we see it actually did indeed preserve um, the, the desired behavior. So again, back up to bend. Let's display the mask. And as I move the attribute paint, we can see we're actually able to reproject and stick on, even though we've changed our topology and changed our uh, deformation. As long as our textures are good, um, we can still reapply the strokes. Now, if you've decided this new reapplied strokes are good, um, what we can do is click on Recache Strokes, and what this will do is bake them in as a new point cache. So now by bypass point cache is off, and now they're actually being stored as point, uh, just the point positions. So if I now change bend, it's going to be fast again um, because we don't actually have to recook all of the um, strokes. Instead, we can just, um, let me just find the draw mask. Uh, we can just turn on all, we can just copy the point values over. So now we have a very fast playback because we've now baked a new set of um, correct values. This brings us to some of the new options in this area. Um, so we have this save point cache to hip file. So by default, whenever you save the hip file now, it's going to save basically what the results of all your um, painting were. This is a very good idea to do in general. So um, one reason is when you open hip file, it'll be faster to get going because it doesn't have to reapply all those strokes. And it also guards you against any risk that there might be changes in how paint behaves that might result in slightly different um, values, and then those could go down your procedural network and have totally different results downstream. So it's it's probably a very good default to do this. Unfortunately, if you're painting on very high resolution geometry, um, this will make your hip files very big. And so you might want to instead say, no, I'm willing to pay the cost of, of regenerating the paints every time. And I'm, because I'm just doing quick little, like if you're just doing a quick little paint over just to grab a tentacle, that, that seems silly to have to, um, you know, save a giant thing to the hip file. So there's an option here to turn it off. If I turn it off, um, I actually have to paint after I've turned it off for it to be registered. That's one catch there. But after that's done, if I save the hip file, 
When I reload, it'll have to reapply from scratch using this recache method. So again, you should make sure that the recache method works um, before you rely on this, because um, it might not if the, if the values were going on types. Um, the sort of opposite of that, actually, is the um, clear stroke history. So clear stroke history basically erases all the uh, the recording of all the strokes you actually performed. I mean, if you spend two hours carefully painting something, you could end up with thousands and thousands of strokes in that stroke geometry. And if you never plan on playing them back again, that's wasted space in your hip file. So you might as well just like harden it and only keep the um, the changes you want. So that's what clear stroke history would do. So right now, recache strokes will leave it unchanged. But if I clear stroke history and recache strokes, I lose everything. Um, because there's nothing to reapply. So I'll just undo that. For the next bit I'll look at is the um, painting on a deformed object, which is rather a neat um, feature, which the old paint shop also had. And um, so I'll start off with a grid. And so in this case, let's make this a bit higher resolution, so it's interesting. And let's bend it. And a G to get our handles up so we can spend this half over like like so. There we go. Nice solid bend. And what I'm going to do is on the bend stop, there's this mask to control how much to bend any particular point on the uh, mask. This becomes sort of like a soft group or soft selection to control how much the bend operation happens. And so if I hit the uh, the paint button, it will create a mask for me. And so I can, uh, this just creates a paint attribute and an attribute create to create the default values. And then I'm able to paint on top. So let's turn on the mask. And we can see the default is to uh, not paint anything. Um, so let's change that a bit. Uh, let's change our default value here to one. In this way, we're going to start off with a fully painted surface. And our idea is going to be we want to sort of unbend parts of this area to make sort of a crinkled rather than an exactly perfectly smooth uh, bend result. So I can go to the uh, bend paint attribute, and I am um, currently have the attribute paint selected and the bend sop displayed. And so by entering the state here, um, there we go, there's my cursor. Um, we can see I, I, I'm actually painting on the deformed attribute, not on the, uh, the, the other one. So if I paint like zero here, I'm basically turning off bending, which is pretty extreme. So let's make our background value more like uh, 0.7 and uh, maybe do some control, some smoothing, just to smooth this up a bit. And so I'll just pick some stuff like this, maybe foreground color to one. And smooth out. And now I have sort of a more crinkled look to how it is bent. And uh, so if I go back down to the bend stop and adjust our bend, we can see we now have a procedural bend with a sort of baked in um, attribute mask on it. And uh, the advantage of doing it this way, of course, is you can look at it from this bent viewpoint how you want to paint, because painting purely on the flat one, you'd have to sort of imagine how this pattern results in a crinkle, whereas here I don't have to imagine, I can directly see um, the effect of what my values are. So this covers most of the discussion of how to use attribute paint. I'd like to briefly go into a little bit of um, how, to, how it actually works. Um, one of the neat things I think about attribute paint compared to the old paint shop is that this is all in um, SOPs, VEX, and Python, it's not in C++. The old one was a C++ SOP and a C++ state, which is sort of the interface for how it works. Um, but this uses our new Python states, and it also uses um, VEX, and also uses SOPs to a great extent. Um, so I'd like to go in and explain how this sort of works at a high level, um, so you're able to start tearing it apart and building new and wonderful things that do even better stuff. So uh, before I go into that, though, I should start with a much simpler um, SOP to look at that gives you a better entry point than attribute paint, because there's a lot of going on under the hood there. Um, and this would be the um, group by lesso. So I'm going to start off with a squab, which is my favorite test geometry by far. And I will do a group, group by lesso, 
And group by lasso is pretty straightforward. Um, the idea is that um, just like lasso selection, this is just sort of a procedural lasso selection. So I select an area here, an area here, and turn around and say I want an area there. And currently it's selected only visible. Um, so I could turn that off and then um, maybe select right through the whole geometry to get both sides. There we go. And then there's a couple extra options. If I look down here, um, shift drag adds, control drag removes, and shift control drag intersects. So I can just sort of remove those parts I don't want. And um, the intersects sort of neat if I um, just reset all my, uh, my strokes here, clear everything, and say I want to um, select something in, in several, several dimensions, like this tentacle that might overlap itself somehow, like this top tentacle. Um, so I can first select all of this, but then I'm like, well, I actually only want the center one. So I can do the um, shift control and then only grab the center one. And that way I can grab at the intersection of those two um, rules for how to select points. So let's look at how this one actually works under the hood. So I'll start off by going to Type Properties. So that just scrolled off the bottom of my screen. So I'm just going to press this button here to move the group by list to the top. So you can see I go to Type Properties, move that on the capture region. And um, there is a new thing in Houdini 18 called Interactive. And these, this stuff used to live in the scripts area. You put it in Python module. Um, but we've decided that the Python states are important enough. They deserve their own area. And this also helps clean up the, some of this growing uh, tab menu um, by moving stuff like shelf tools, handles, and selectors in here as well. So this is where all the sort of interactive behavior of this node lives. And so the viewer state one is what we use specifically for um, viewer states. And um, we can see here that the group by lasso state um, is a class which inherits from the stroke state. And uh, which is a hint, this is very much like how we built old uh, strokes-based tools. We'd say they're um, based off the stroke state. Um, but previously, we had to add a bunch of uh, callbacks and other magic parameter names to control how they behave. But now you can inherit the stroke state behavior and get a lot of control yourself over how it works. Um, so there's these various, it's a, it's a framework-based system. So there's things like on pre-stroke and uh, build metadata array and on post-stroke where you can sort of go in and say, what do you want to do when each stroke is completed? Um, so in this case, we manage, we turn off our cursor so we don't end up with the cursor shown all the time. We put our own fancy prompt in for what it should say. And then the on post stroke pretty much just resets the, the thing because it's it just uses all the stuff in there. And we use the con shift and control keys to control which tool we're running, which lets us uh, run those choices. The uh, Metadata array one is kind of interesting because the usual thing for the stroke state was any parameter with a stroke underscore prefix would be copied into the metadata of the stroke node. Um, but this involved a lot of phantom parameters being created whose sole purpose was just to copy into the stroke metadata. Um, so if your state needs to inject something, it can just uh, hook into this and add it at just in time. So in particular, what you can do is you can inject the exact screen transform. So this is a projection matrix which will get you from um, the screen space locations in pixels directly into the space of this object that you need to draw in and vice versa. So this allows us to uh, take these uh, cursor uh, drawn things and um, do a proper uh, comparison with them. So if I unlock the contents here, allow edit in and dive in, and see, this is a pretty straightforward setup. We have the stroke, which comes in from the parent, which stores all the geometry of all the strokes that have been drawn. And we convert those into a screen space location. So in this case, they're flat in a very large area. This is actually measured in pixels. And with that, we're able to do the intersection computation pretty easily um, because we basically take our position, convert to that stroke screen space location, and then becomes a 2D intersection problem we solve with intersect. And we loop over all of them and find out if we're in all the particular places. And then this SQL code here is mostly just about uh, making sure we merge all the groups together because you want to merge with any existing groups and so forth. And then this whole section over here is just purely for display. So this is where the guide geometry is generated. And so when we are here and we have our guide geometry, you can have things like whether or not I want them show with projectives so you can see them sort of as 3D volumes. That's all controlled by that other side network. So 
let's look at an attribute paint. This is considerably more complicated than the previous one was. Let me dive into it. Actually, first, let me make sure I've got uh, something interesting on here. I will go and uh, got the test geometry. I'll turn bypass point cache. I'll set up the interior behavior so I can get more geometry inside to walk through this. So this is very daunting. Uh, let's just maximize this for now. This whole top half here is caching and um, setup code. This center section here is the computation of basically the stencil buffer for a paint stroke and applying that paint stroke through the stencil buffer. And this little tail section here is to apply the current cached paint operation back on top of fresh geometry. So the general idea is um, we, we get injected a bunch of cache data from what had been painted before and what the current strokes are um, from the state, and that shows up at this top. And we also, of course, have the input geometry coming here. Um, we then, for any of the brand new strokes that are present, we need to reapply them to the input geometry. And we store the result as a series of um, over operations as attributes. And those attributes we actually take from down here, I believe, and we send them back up um, into the uh, into here, somewhere up here. Uh, I forget exactly where it is. And where it'll come back down and reapply to actually apply those attributes out at the end. Um, so and dive in a little bit more closely now. And so if we look at where the cache points are, um, we have this cache stroke here. Um, this is all the history of all the strokes you've drawn. Um, we don't keep them as a multi-parm. We keep clearing out the multi-parm and, reset and resetting it. Um, the group by Lasso, you'll notice, had a multi-parm that grew. Um, but if you get thousands of things in a multi-parm, things get slow. Um, so we actually just turn it into geometry right away to forestall that problem. Um, this stash is interesting. This is the intersection geometry. Um, this is only used when you're painting on something other than the input. So usually you're painting on the input, but in the case of like painting on that deformed uh, grid, um, it would had to tell the SOP what the thing to paint on was, and the state did that by shoving data into this intersect geometry. Um, so that's not saved in disk. That's only used in live sessions. Similarly, we have the cache stencil. This is all the attribute values of what has been painted already. And so currently, this has the attribute mask F, attribute mask F alpha. These are the values that we painted, and these are how strongly we painted them. So as we recall, some areas are erased or have never been painted. Those would have an alpha of zero, and so it wouldn't change the alpha mask and other ones would, would set it. So it basically does an over operation with these two values. For every type of attribute you're painting, you're going to have one of these um, pairs of attributes here. The unsaved cache is currently empty. Only one of these will be present at any time. Um, the big difference is this one is not saved to disk and this one is saved to disk. So this is what that save to disk um, file option will change is where we end up saving them. Um, we also have another one hidden in here, which is the active stroke stencil. Um, so this is actually used very precisely while you're drawing a stroke. If you draw a very long stroke, like spend like 10 seconds drawing a stroke, if we kept redrawing it from scratch every time, it would get slower and slower and your frame rate would go down. So instead, we only draw the, the newest part of the stroke, but that means we need to recall um, what it was you had done up to then. Because for things like, um, like for many operations like um, add, you don't want to reapply an add on places you already had added to within a single stroke, because that would not be expected. Um, so we need to make it one application, but we need to merge together with your previous stuff. So this stores the current neg alpha of the previous round and allows us to just paint on the net new pieces. So uh, first thing that happens at the top here. Um, is we take our cache strokes and we will um, recache them. So this is where that recache operations uh, choices are of whether you send new arrays, use primitive UVs or texture UVs, or just use the original values. Um, so this updates their uh, internal values so they're able to possibly work on the new deformed geometry. Then over here, the stroke SOP is where the brand new curve comes in. And so if we want to reapply everything, we have to merge them all together. But otherwise, we only run on the brand new one as well. And from that, we go into this for loop. And the for loop usually only runs a single iteration for most times, because you're only drawing off one piece of one stroke. Um, but if we end up restarting from scratch, obviously, this is where we go through all the, all the pieces. Um, so we take their first one. And what we have to do is actually um, leave factor and pressure points. 
How is this? Just let me check this here. Yes. So factor in pressure points has this um, idea here of remove points if we're below the uh, previous stroke count. And um, this is actually specifically to ensure we only draw on the net new points. So the previous stroke count keeps track of how many times we had, uh, how many points were in the previous stroke that we drew. And so we're able to thus not draw on any of the, um, the old ones because they're already cached in, in place. Um, so we take our current stroke, we project into screen space, set up the internal names, and then we also have to apply on top to find out what our new alpha is. We store here as the neg alpha, which is one minus the alpha for where, where we need to write in. So the different ways of drawing all show up here. We have drawing with the volume or the screen brush, which end up being the same. Uh, airbrush or the screen brush is just a volume in 2D. Um, we likewise have the surface drawing, which uses surface distances. Flood drawing, which is pretty straightforward, all or nothing. And of course, nearest point, which is actually the one that's quite different because it needs to um, work the other way around. So it needs just to find one point as opposed to apply to all points. And then we have another switch here um, because you'd be drawing in the UV viewport, and in which case you'll end up in this side where almost everything ends up becoming a volume brush because there's no real equivalent of a surface in that world. Um, then having updated what that neg alpha is, we need to actually apply the neg alpha to the current alpha, and that's where the different paint operations are. We could paint on top, we could erase it, we can do an eyedropper, which does nothing whatsoever in this cook state because that's all up to the overlying viewer state handles updating the foreground values from that. And of course, calculating smooth requires extra work because we need to actually find a smooth and kernel and smooth uh, the neighboring values. The result of all this is this um, post-supply each stroke. And so this becomes our stencil cache. So we delete all the geometry and keep only the points here. Um, that's what this does. Uh, in order to ensure we have as lightweight a thing to save to the hit file as possible, we also delete all the attributes that are not relevant. Um, and we then feed that back up into this cache stencil or the unsaved cache stencil. And so after putting that back up in there, um, it can flow through. And when we cook down here, we will get the, um, the application of that. And so we run through each one of the attributes we have, and we apply that attribute by reading off the appropriate stencil values and just applying them as a vector, float, or integer. And the result then is your live geometry. Now, when I talked about those uh, cache values being fed back, um, it's a question of where they get fed back to. If we look at the parameter interface here, let me restore my parameter interface to its proper location. Um, you're not going to see where they go because these are invisible parameters. Uh, what I can do is go type properties. Oh, yeah, there again, I need to type properties. And on parameters, show invisible parameters, and we'll see a lot more show up here. So a whole stroke tab that shows up that was invisible. Um, but there's also down inside the recache world, there is the stroke geometry, intersect geometry, active stroke stencil, baked geometry, and unsaved baked geometry. Um, the unsaved values will not have this tag, side effects save value zero, and that's what causes them to be flagged not to be saved at the hip file. Um, so you can see three of them don't have that. The strokes and the um, baked geometry get that saved in. The other interesting point here is that when I turn this on and off, you'll note this stroke attribute and stroke attribute type appear and disappear. Um, so when we selected something through this attribute menu, it's got a callback on it, which causes it to set the actual stroke attribute and stroke attribute type. These are the ones actually used by the tool for which attribute's current. Um, and so this just looks up at that multi parm and copies it back in. So that helps avoid, um, uh, make it simpler for people and so they don't have to worry about typing the right attribute name in. Now, let's talk about the next question, namely how can I take this and embed it into a digital asset? So I'm going to start off with a new um, squab here. After paint. It's obviously not the attribute paint in question. Um, we're going to ask this to be turned into a digital asset, so this attribute paint. So let me uh, collapse it and create a digital asset out of it. For just testing digital ass assets like this, uh, it's useful to um, save the library called embedded. This will save only to my hip file, so I don't have anything extra to delete from the hard drive when I'm done. OK, so what I want to do is import um, basically, all the parameters of this up to here. Now, the usual way I do this is I'll like drag and drop parameters from here to there, but that will get boring very quickly because there's a lot of parameters. 
making things worse, there's a lot of invisible parameters I need to promote, and uh, trying to select them is difficult. There is ways to get to some of the invisible parameters. Um, I can go to the search menu over here, and the search menu has a visible, invisible, and hidden parameters that lets me see um, what isn't visible. So now all of a sudden I can get additional um, parameters show up, like these stroke geometry parameters. But that actually misses some. For example, currently it doesn't show the stroke tab, um, which hopefully will be fixed at some point, but uh, it doesn't help you today. The other option is uh, from nodes. I can go here to from nodes and select attribute paint. The problem is this does not show invisible parameters either, even if I turn on invisible parameters. Um, so it's kind of a difficult thing to do. So there is a way, thankfully. I can go here to folders, create a folder, and then this folder I will make an import block. So import blocks are, uh, they don't show up as folders in the UI, they're just these uh, um, semantic areas that you can use to import another node's uh, parameters in. We use this often when we need to promote a whole bunch of parameters from a subnode. Maybe that subnode gets new parameters in the future and you wish to re-import, you don't want to have to drag by hand, um, you just want to refresh the imports. So here I can say my source is up colon um, attrib paint one. And now when I do a refresh imports, it would theoretically um, refresh everything, except it won't. Because again, we have to worry about invisible parameters. I can turn on invisible parameters, so I see them at all here. But this gear menu up here has a option, promote invisible parameters. You have to be very careful with this because it keeps turning itself off. It's not saved um, by default. Um, so every time you start up again, you'll forget that you didn't have it set. Um, so turn on promote invisible parameters. Now I can refresh imports, and I realize I misnamed attribute paint. It's not attribute paint one, it's attribute paint two. So there we go. Let's try that again. Refresh imports, and it brought in a whole bunch of parameters. And I can see a whole bunch of parameters here. That's excellent. Make sure I'm not in a state, and uh, go hit apply. And I see a whole bunch of parameters here, so that's good. And it kept them invisible, which is rather nice, so I don't have them messing up my UI here. Now what I do want to do, though, is go to the um, set my default state. And the name of the state is side effects attrib paint. And now with that set as the state, I can hit enter. And we can now paint. So we can say, yes, we have indeed created this new subnet actually has the whole interface of attribute paint um, despite being a custom subnet. So this lets you do stuff like if you want to do some post-processing afterwards or if you want to um, build a paint in a larger HDA, it's possible. Now all these parameters are not necessary. The, uh, a lot of them are optional and it will do the uh, logical default if they're missing um, and other ones can be removed because they're only needed because other ones are there. For example, the attribute type um, could be restricted to just have a fixed attribute, for example. Um, that said, the state might need some of them, but what we can also do is subclass. So just like the um, attribute paint is a subclass of the stroke state, um, what we could do is, uh, when we make a new one, create our own interactive state and subclass off the attribute paint state, uh, the paint state here. And if we subclass off this, we only have to override the methods that we need to change to get our particular behavior that we want, and we can use the default behavior attribute paint in the other cases. But this is uh, considerably more um, Python work to get that going, so I won't try and uh, do that here. Um, another option, of course, is just to cut and paste this code and then um, build your own out of that, um, or like group lasso, build one from scratch from that level. So thank you very much for um, sticking with me for this uh, discussion of attribute paint. I hope it was interesting. And I really look forward to what's done with uh, Python states and people uh, making even more evolved tools. I hope Attribute Paint shows that Python states can be very performant and fast and can support all the different use cases that people have. So thank you again.